Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our penultimate installment of Birkbeck's Science Saturdays. I'm Dr. Jilly Forrester, and I will be hosting you this morning um, through two excellent talks by our guest speakers, Dr. Simon Green and Dr. Uta Lersch, um, both from Birkbeck University of London's School of Science and um, home to Birkbeck's Department of Psychological Sciences. But before I tell you about today's topic and invite our speakers to join us, I want to tell you a little bit about Science Saturdays. Science Saturdays is a free series of public talks um, and then they're aimed at really just some public engagement and sharing science with all the people around us. Uh, we want to make science as accessible as possible. We're in collaboration with the Me Human Project and the National Saturday Club. Now, the Me Human Project is a public engagement project that's focused around sharing science with the public to gain a better understanding of our place in the natural world. And we do this through education, public engagement activities, and citizen science collaborations. The National Saturday Club is a charitable organization that makes higher education accessible to youths across the nation. So we've been here every Saturday morning in May um, and we're covering new topics every week with two scientists from Birkbeck. Our topics have ranged from viruses and antibodies to how the brain develops and evolves um, to be the kind of special primates that we are today. We've even looked at life beyond the universe just to showcase the huge breadth of uh, different science topics um, that we have at Birkbeck's uh, School of Science and just some pretty incredible research that's going on at the institution as well. So you might be wondering how this is any different from the science podcasts that, that you might see. Um, well, our preliminary aim is not, is not just to showcase our scientists and the research that they're doing um, and the subject areas where they have their specializations, but we're also interested in the scientists themselves. So how did these individuals find their way into their current roles? Was there a straight path from their GCSEs to A-levels to university um, to gaining posts at academic institutions or did they have a different entry point? We know from our own experience as academics that actually the straight line to your job is actually more rare than a wiggly road and a wiggly path. And sometimes that wiggly path is actually a benefit to your job and your research. Um, and also in the way that you're able to um, uh, share your experiences and your mentorship with the students uh, that, that you're able to oversee and supervise. So we're gonna be asking our scientists about how they uh, gained their, their current positions. Um, and we also want to understand whether their science involves any creativity or an imagination so what does it take to be an effective or good scientist? Um, and how do you develop your, your scientific experimentation? Um, can there be a place for imagination um, and creativity in a scientist's daily life? Um, so we're gonna be asking our scientists those questions as well. So don't forget that you can join in the discussion as well. You can type your questions into the chat bar um, on the YouTube site here and we'll pick them up and we've got time for a couple of questions after each speaker and we've also got time for some additional questions at the end uh, when we'll have a little panel. So just to recap, you can join us today um, and next Saturday for our final Science Saturday Talks. But don't worry if you've missed previous weeks because you can find all of the previous 10 talks, um, there will be in total for the month of May, on Birkbeck's YouTube channel. And again, we're just trying to make science as accessible and enjoyable for everyone, regardless of age and previous experience. So let's move on to today's topic. It's called Mind the Mind. And I have my, my me human brain here um, as my prop today because we often think about disorders as something that is uh, misbehaving uh, in our brains and is negatively influencing the way we think we feel and we behave. So today we're going to hear from two very experienced speakers about ways to combat disrupted functioning of our brains. We'll hear about um, approaches using drugs to different types of psychological therapies and what works and why. So 
Let's now meet our two speakers. I'm going to ask Dr. Simon Green and Dr. Utalersh uh, to join the call. Hi, Jenny. Hey, so, Simon. Good morning. Good morning, Uta. Uh, so thanks for being with us this morning. Um, Simon, you're a lecturer in neuroscience and evolutionary psychology, um, and you're going to be speaking first today on the topic of the biology and culture of psychiatric disorders. Um, Uta, you're going to follow up from that um, and tell us about um, resilience. You're, you're a clinical psychologist. Um, you're also lecturing. Um, and you've recently started up a new adventure, um, massive project called Withstand the Storm. And you're gonna be telling us about how we can withstand the storm um, using techniques to build our resilience. Um, so thank you again for, for being with us today and making this contribution to Birkbeck's uh, Science Saturdays. Simon, are you ready? I'm ready, I'll share my screen. Fantastic, thanks Simon. Um, I'm gonna mute my video and my audio. Uh, and we'll hear from you and we'll come back and, and gather some questions. Okay. Right. Okay, hello everybody and thanks for joining us uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, today in this shortish talk, I just want to bring out some general approaches um, to uh, understanding and treating uh, psychiatric disorders, or uh, we also call them um, psychological disorders or psychopathologies. There are various names, but uh, I'm sure you understand what I'm going to be talking about. Now, um, I'm using the term culture initially to refer to do two very different approaches that have been used over the last century uh, in understanding and treating disorders. Um, Psychiatry uh, is a medical profession. Psychiatrists have been through a medical training and they have picked up on the medical model of physical illness um, and they try to apply it to psychological disorders. Uh, this can be referred to as the biomedical model. You will know it best because of its emphasis on drug therapies. Um, if you go to your doctor um, with a variety of disorders, for many of them, there will be a drug that they can prescribe, such as an anti-anxiety drug, an antidepressant. Um, psychiatry has dominated uh, the diagnosis and treatment of disorders. Um, but more recently, over the last 20 to 30 years, clinical psychology has um, achieved a little more prominence in the area. Clinical psychology is for people who have taken a psychology degree and they've done postgraduate training in various models of psychological disorders and therapies. These are um, people you would have heard of, Freud and Jung, uh, who've been around for more than a century now, or their approaches have anyway, um, to the more recent uh, and widespread, and most people have heard of cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. Now, training after your psychology degree, your applied training in models and therapies is regulated by professional bodies such as the British Psychological Society. So you can say, you know, I am an accredited therapist, but accreditation is not necessary for setting up a practice. And as a small warning, you'll see on the web and in various other places, lots of advertisements for um, therapists and counselors, et cetera, et cetera. But many of these would not have been through a formal training and uh, many will not be accredited through a professional body. So there's just a little word of warning there. The accreditation does imply some sort of rigorous background and training. But these have been two very different approaches to understanding and treating disorders. Psychiatry focus on drugs in particular, clinical psychology focusing more on psychological methods, approaches, and treatments. Where do they come together? They come together in this thing, the brain. Okay, we aren't going into detail here. I just wanted to remind you what a brain looks like. The front is on the left, the back is on the right. Okay, the brain, this is where it all happens. The biomedical approach or the psychological approach. We're still focusing on what changes in the brain. Is this easy? Well, don't worry about the terms here, the letters, this is a side view of the brain. 
and it's a simple diagram of pathways in the brain. The blue pathways um, use a chemical in the brain called dopamine. You have one pathway running up to the frontal cortex. You have another set of pathways running up to the uh, what we call the striatum, and that pathway is involved in Parkinson's disease. And this means, this sort of implies that, uh, hey, the brain's quite simple. Dopamine pathway here running up there, another one going up to the striatum, fine, we understand all that. Well, gross oversimplification, okay? This is uh, a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, and this is pathways in the brain, long paths running through the brain, and just looking at that, you can get some idea of the complexity of the brain, of this thing we're working with and trying to understand. Now, where does this complexity come from? Well, the basic unit of the brain is called a neuron. Again, don't worry about the terminology here. This is just to give you a picture of a standard stereotyped neuron, a brain cell called a neuron. From the left, down to the right hand end, they are elongated, they're long, okay? Information in the brain travels along the neuron from the left hand side to the right hand side in the form of nerve impulses, electrical activity, funnels information down the neuron, okay? One basic principle. The second basic principle that you have to have an outline of, <laughs> I know this is a, Really scary slide, um, even my psychology students uh, find it scary, but uh, I just want you to pick up on the, the simplest bits and pieces here. The yellow blob is the end of a neuron, the right-hand end of that neuron we saw previously. The green blob at the bottom is the following neuron. Note, there's a gap between them. That gap is the synapse, written on the right here, the synapse or synaptic cleft. It's a physical gap. It's only millionth of a meter wide, but it is a physical gap between one neuron and the next neuron. So we have information in the form of electrical impulses traveling down the yellow blob to the end of the yellow blob. There, it causes the release of what are called neurotransmitters, chemicals, molecules of chemicals, tiny of course, released into the synapse where they travel across and they combine with what we call receptors on the green neuron, okay? Neurotransmitters released from the yellow blob into the synapse, they travel across and combine with receptors on the following neuron. And in a hugely complicated process, they conduct information from the yellow neuron across to the green neuron. So we have electrical transmission down the neuron and then chemical transmission or conduction across the synapse. Now, why am I emphasizing this? This is because it's at the synapse that drugs will act. We have drugs that will increase the amount of neurotransmitter, drugs that will decrease the amount, drugs that will affect the receptors, okay? This is the focus for uh, studies of drug action in the brain. Now, another important point to remember is if we go back to our neuron, fairly simple structure. Neurons have been around since um, um, beginnings of evolution and living things flobbing around on the seabed. They haven't changed very much. Where does our complexity come from? We have 80 billion, roughly speaking, 80 billion billion of these neurons in our brain. Some of course have more and some have less. Each of these neurons make synapses and it's estimated each one will make of the order of a thousand synaptic connections with other neurons. 80 billion neurons, roughly a thousand connections each. Okay, complexity. The number of stars in a galaxy apparently according to Professor Brian Cox. So that's where our complexity comes from. And that's why any model of brain function, whether it's a psychological disorder or memory or whatever is necessarily has to be very complicated. Now, I want to use two conditions to exemplify some issues in um, dealing with psychiatric or psychological disorders. If we look at schizophrenia, 
something, well, everyone will know the term. How is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed on the basis of symptoms. Some of these we refer to as positive symptoms, and these include the classic delusions. These can be paranoid delusions where you think the world's out to get you. I mean, it might be, but most often it's a delusional state. Hallucinations are usually hearing voices talking about you or to you. And there can be general incoherence in thought and language. The, the, what they're talking about is bizarre, doesn't make sense, is not connected with the current situation. But there are also negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, catatonia is where the person is completely unresponsive. They may literally sit in the corner just rocking quietly backwards and forwards. There can also be a loss of emotional responsiveness, which we call flat affect or flat emotion can be inappropriate, expressed in inappropriate situations. And there can be general cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment, what does that mean? It means their ability to plan in particular, uh, to use um, uh, experience to guide future behavior and things like this are generally not functioning properly. And schizophrenia is diagnosed on the basis of these symptoms. You have to have at least one of the positive symptoms uh, and you have to have two symptoms altogether. One problem with schizophrenia there isn't time to go into is that therefore two patients may have absolutely no symptoms in common. Um, and this has been a debate for a hundred years uh, about um, the lack of consistency in diagnosing schizophrenia. But in its classic form, people having delusions and hallucinations, it can be recognized as a clear disorder. Compare this with depression, what we call unipolar depression to separate it from the bipolar form. Look at these symptoms, sad, depressed mood, loss of pleasure in usual things, sleeping problems, appetite changes, loss of energy, guilt and worthlessness. Well, probably speaking for myself here, but most people have experienced some of these at some point, maybe not the last one, but you know, these are different to the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia, hallucinations and delusions. What we find with these is that they are um, they look like normal behavior. This is life. Being down occasionally, problems with sleeping, changes in appetite, loss of energy, you know, feeling a bit worthless, you know, and problems in concentration. Okay, so look at the top, five of these for at least two weeks. So we try and make it clearer by saying these affect your life. If they're going on for two weeks, they're going to affect your work and family life. Um, and it means they're severe. So it tries to move it away from the, you know, this is an issue with existence. You know, these things happen to everyone all the time to saying this has to last for quite a long time. But it still doesn't mean there aren't, there aren't issues. If we look at the two of them, we have schizophrenia, where there's a loss of insight, which is really what psychosis means. The person with schizophrenia may not recognize that they actually have a condition called schizophrenia or that they have any problems at all. So there's less self-diagnosis. They don't rush along to the doctor to say, I'm hearing voices, please diagnose me. Um, quite often they have to be referred by their family or by professionals uh, to be diagnosed and treated. So uh, the psychiatrist or doctor or clinical psychologist has to look for behavioral change that we call signs and various symptoms that may be reported by the individual uh, or by the family. Um, the clearest cases will have these psychotic symptoms, which are clear additions to normal behavior. In depression, insight is maintained. The depressed person knows they're depressed. The symptoms do run along with your, our experience of everyday living. So there are issues about thresholds for clinical diagnosis. Many people with depression will go along to their doctor, but that will vary between individuals. Some people will feel a bit down for a few days and think I'm depressed, I'm off to the doctor. Other people will say I've been down for a few days, but hey, you know, that's life. And this feeds into um, the talk that Uta will be giving afterwards on resilience and how we develop resilience to some of the issues uh, that we have to confront in everyday life. Okay, so these two conditions are quite different in many ways, and yet they're both classified clearly as psychological disorders. 
The biomedical model also makes a number of assumptions. It assumes for many conditions, genetic factors will be important. And Dr. Meeburn last week gave a very nice overview of how we look for genetic factors in behavior and in disorders. Um, something like schizophrenia has a very high genetic loading, maybe 50 to 60%, um, not quite as high as bipolar disorder, but the um, person using the biomedical model will often assume there is a significant genetic component. Far less in depression, but people would argue there is a 10 to 15% genetic risk. In the medical model, they might also look for changes to brain structure. Because of advances in brain scanning, we can look for changes in the brains of people with autism, uh, psychopathy, schizophrenia. And in these conditions, there are uh, they aren't very consistent from person to person, but um, you can often identify uh, what we call pathology, two parts of the brain in these conditions. Uh, the biomedical model also heavily emphasizes changes in those brain chemicals I talked about, those neurotransmitters that conduct information across the synapse that are critical in brain function. And for many years, uh, there's been a popular view that depression, for instance, is linked to decreases in serotonin in the brain. Uh, schizophrenia is linked to changes in a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Serotonin and dopamine, many of you will have come across in your general reading. Uh, they're popular in the media. They are neurotransmitters in the brain operating at those synapses I referred to earlier. And the biomedical model, a very heavy focus on drug therapy acting through these neurotransmitter pathways. So there are drugs which will affect serotonin levels in the brain, drugs which will affect dopamine levels. There has been little emphasis on psychological and environmental factors in the biomedical model, um, which is silly because we know that depression is often associated with life events. Um, but what's driving the biomedical model is very rapid developments in our techniques for studying the brain in imaging techniques, advances in genetic research that Dr. Meeburn talked about last week are driving the biomedical model. It's saying we know, we know more and more about the brain in these conditions. However, if we look at psychological models, they're emphasizing psychological and sociocultural variables. Um, now, approaches, there are an enormous number of different approaches within psychological models. We have uh, what most people again have heard of, psychodynamic approaches, uh, Freud and Jung, personality development, family dynamics during the early stages, the, the um, um, stages of psychosexual development, uh, id, ego and superego. Psychodynamic approach is still very popular. But what's become more popular in practice, psychodynamic approaches tend to take a very long time um, and cognitive approaches in theory take less time. Um, and the cognitive approach looks at thinking. The classic example is Beck um, and his views on depression. His approach, cognitive, which is approach in a category called cognitive behavior therapy. His approach is that the depressed person has negative views of the world and our place in it. Um, so you always take a negative bias. <coughs> you exaggerate the bad things that happen and you minimize the good things that happen. If at A level um, you're taking four A levels and you get three A stars and an A, you don't say, wow, three A stars, that's brilliant, I'm wonderful. You say, God, an A, failure. You know, what went wrong? Why is it all so bad? <laughs> okay, you can apply it in life ter terms as well. You can look back and think, hey, you know, I've had a great life. This has happened. That's happened. I have a number of um, um, achievements I can look back on with pride. Or if you're a little bit like me, you tend to look back and think, uh, I sort of peaked when I won the uh, school cross country championship. Um, and ever since then, it's been pretty much up and down. Okay. Negative thinking leads to depression because you don't see the good side of things. And the therapy aims to train the client into more positive ways of thinking by indicating um, that some events are positive, uh, that life is not quite as awful as you think it is. Um, of course, it doesn't work if life is actually as awful as you think it is. But in general, uh, many people have 
an unreasonably negative view of what's going on. And cognitive behavior therapy can help you change those views. And it, it makes you practice, it makes you keep a diary, so you get a realistic picture of what your life is like. It's not actually all that bad. There are good things in it. So um, the cognitive approach has become very popular over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, but if you have a psychological disorder, what you want to know is what's going to work. Well, if we look at the effectiveness of therapies, drug therapy, the biomedical model, is never 100% effective. For both schizophrenia and depression, you will have 30 to 50% roughly of patients who are what we call treatment resistant, right? But of course, for many people, drugs can be very effective. So I'm not disputing that at all. But it's important to realize that drugs are never 100% effective. So you might think, is one type of therapy better for some conditions and another type of therapy better for other conditions? Well, yes. Um, what we find is psychological therapies, in particular CBT, where there have been a number of reviews of trials using CBT, cognitive behavior therapy in schizophrenia, um, find it is not generally effective. And you can understand why. Many people with schizophrenia will lack insight uh, and the ability to take part in that therapeutic exchange. You have to talk to a therapist, you have to have insight into your condition, you have to be able to talk through possible explanations and possible strategies, okay? So it is not generally effective, but there's clear evidence that for some people with schizophrenia, particularly those who have episodes between psychotic episodes, if, sorry, if they have periods between psychotic episodes where they're rational, and understand they have this condition, then they can be helped with CBT. But in general, it would not be recommended. However, when we look at depression, there's clear evidence that psychological therapies are equally as effective as drugs in treating mild to moderate depression. And psychological therapies also avoid drug side effects, which can be very severe. But of course, there are issues that we may discuss later in terms of how do you access psychological therapies. You may wait six months, a year, 18 months for a referral to the NHS. Um, so unless you can afford therapeutic sessions, then it can be hard to access CBT for depression. But clear evidence is as effective as drugs and without the side effects and may be more effective in the long term. Uh, just moving towards the close now with um, just going back to neurotransmitters in the brain, drugs used in schizophrenia uh, block the neurotransmitter dopamine at the synapse. This has led to what we call the dopamine hypothesis or explanation for schizophrenia. That is caused by high levels of dopamine activity which are blocked by the drugs. Depression, effective antidepressants uh, act through what we call serotonin systems, the neurotransmitter serotonin. Uh, drugs such as Prozac are actually from a group of drugs called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, and their role is to increase serotonin activity in the brain. And that le leads us with a serotonin hypothesis. The problem is this sounds as though we've explained these conditions. Schizophrenia, dopamine, depression is serotonin. But these are simply what we call correlations. It's an association between a condition like depression and low levels of serotonin. It tells us nothing about what's producing the lower levels of serotonin. Is there a genetic component? Is it life events? Is it stress? We don't know. So um, beware of seeing something in the paper that says we've explained depression, it's low levels of serotonin. That is simply passing the problem on. Uh, low levels of serotonin are simply associated with depression. We don't know what's causing them. Okay, that's an important point. Um, psychological models and neurotransmitters, are they relevant at all? Well, yes, because psychological processes must work through brain systems and neurotransmitter. The brain is all we have. When you're sitting there thinking, gosh, I don't understand a word of this, in theory, we could identify the patterns of brain activity that represent, I don't understand a word of this. Okay, everything you're doing, saying, looking, thinking, feeling, remembering, will be reflected in changes in brain activity. Okay, we know that life stress can have an effect on serotonin levels in the brain. 
and that in turn may trigger depression. Okay, so we aren't saying an explanation of depression in terms of life stress or in terms of low serotonin levels, they are not exclusive. Life stress has to act through the brain to produce depression, right? Psychological therapies may alter negative thinking styles. You become more positive, uh, you're bright and happy and life is good. Well, that change in your mood state must be reflected in brain changes, okay? Something like perhaps increased serotonin level. So there's no contradiction between a psychological explanation and having a model of that disorder. Eventually, they will all link up together. We'll have the genetic background, we'll have the, the impact of life events, and we'll put it all together and say, this is uh, the brain activity, these are the circuits within the brain that are involved in this condition, and this is how they are influenced by genetics and family background, and also by your life at the moment, levels of stress, etc. Okay, so it can all come together. Finally, um, a brief point on true cultural factors. Uh, and this is an issue with research in general and in psychology in particular. The most research is uh, carried out in prosperous Western societies. Um, mental distress has often been stigmatized in the past. You were ashamed if you had a clinical condition like schizophrenia or depression or severe anxiety. Um, this is changing, of course, um, largely due to Prince Harry. Um, now we have a number of celebrities who are going into the media and talking about their, um, uh, the problems they have had through lockdown or through their life in general. Um, this is, uh, although one may argue about the platforms, uh, there's no doubt it, it, it has the benefit of changing attitudes to mental distress in the sense so uh, you think I'm not having a good time, but hey, nobody else is either. <laughs> um, but in the West as well, we tend to prioritize feeling good. And, you know, I'm feeling bad, you know, I shouldn't, I should be feeling okay. Um, we're a very individualistic culture. Uh, we see people as rather self-contained and what we call autonomous, that they can act on their own behalf and look after themselves. Therefore, in some senses, they're more responsible for what happens to them and that can induce feelings of guilt uh, because you're very depressed, because you're very anxious. Um, with schizophrenia, it's less common because if you have a psychosis, you don't have perhaps that level of insight. Um, with, um, yeah, sorry, that leads of course to psychological disorders in the West being seen as more biomedical. We have a tendency to say, I have anxiety, give me some pills. I have depression, give me some pills. In less prosperous societies, um, you tend to have more community-based and there's more of an interpersonal context. People are more together. They have different belief systems. If you have a strongly held cultural belief, um, we sort of lost that over here to, to an extent, um, Hinduism, Buddhism, that will alter your attitude to behavior in general and to psychological disorders with less emphasis on the individual and more on the social background. And that leads to differences in the frequency and in the presentation, that means the symptoms, if you like, and the outcome of disorders, okay? Uh, there are higher rates of depression in richer societies. Um, the course of schizophrenia, um, schizophrenia occurs 0.5 to 1% across the world. It seems to be cross-culturally consistent but the course of schizophrenia seems to be less severe. Once it's diagnosed, the course seems to be to take a more positive course in non-Western societies because of these issues of how they perceive the individual in relation to their culture. So this is a whole area uh, that is unexplored. There are books on it, there are papers on it, but relative to biomedical research, this area has been um, pretty much unexplored. Okay. Um, that was a little bit of a gallop and I hope you've followed the material and the arguments, uh, but there are some key points there uh, that depends very much on the disorder you have. Um, the most common ones, there are arguments in favor of both biomedical and psychological approaches, um, but hopefully Uta is going to show us the value of developing a resilience, okay, and becoming less dependent on prescribed drugs. Okay, Julie, thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, 
that was fascinating. And I learned something new every time I hear you speak. It's it's not a wonder to me that you're um, annually rated the, the best, uh, <laughs> best psychology lecturer in the department. Uh, so thank you for that fascinating talk. Um, we've we've got a couple of questions trickling in, um, and, and I'll I'll bring those up to you in in a second. Um, but this last slide does lead me to a question of my own that I'm quite interested in, and wondering if you have a take on it. Um, with psychiatric disorders or conditions, it's often that it's our own perception and others' perception of disruption to our daily functioning that will bring us to know that there's an issue and want to go get and seek some treatment. Um, but doesn't our perspective on what is a disruption to our functioning, the way we think, feel, and behave change based on the society norms around us? Absolutely. Um, it it, it uh, uh, depends very much on the um, so social context. Um, the most popular diagnostic system is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM. That began in 1952, and there have been five versions of that, the most recent one in 2013. And every time it's revised, some disorders disappear. Like in the 1950s, homosexuality was in the first version of DSM. In the versions up to 1973, there were no eating disorders. Now, we have obviously homosexuality is gone. Eating disorders take up a chunk of the most recent DSM. Um, we have uh, um, changes every time it's revised. I think there are 137 disorders in the current version. In the previous DSM 4, there were 254. So psychiatric diagnosis is not a precise art and it will change depending on the social context. What we will find is if there's a general sense that mental distress is becoming acceptable. I mean, I find it rather alarming that the number of people who do report this mental distress, it'd be nice to have some celebrities coming on and saying, hey, you know, life hasn't been great, but it's been okay, you know, and I've survived through it all. Um, if it makes mental distress more acceptable, it may lower that threshold for saying, hey, you have know, been down for a few days, this is, depression just like so-and-so had and I'm off to the doctor um, and I think that that's um, you can't change it it's the way social uh, societies evolve um, and but yes it is something we have to keep in mind all the time and people who go into psychology in the future and you go into this area you will find there are huge debates about the whole value of psychiatric diagnosis so it pretends this condition is separate from that condition well Depression and anxiety often overlap. If you look at the genetic foundations, you find the genetic bases, as Emma Meeburn mentioned last week, these conditions are affected by hundreds of genes of small effect, okay? They're now finding that schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism, ADHD, all have some of these genetic factors in common. So treating them as totally separate conditions is not really, justified sorry I'm going on a bit so you, you've <laughs> just picked up on a question from one of our viewers Patricia who's asked very interesting thank you Simon where does anxiety fit in well anxiety is diagnosed under DSM-4 there will be a list of symptoms which will look very much like everyday symptoms we can all feel uh, feeling anxious you know predicting the future feeling a bit cautious and fearful um, and it's diagnosed, therefore, in a parallel way to depression. It's treated with anti-anxiety drugs, but uh, one of the early um, um, controversies in the area was um, Librium and Valium, people will have heard of. These come from a, a group called the benzodiazepines and are still prescribed for anxiety disorders. Um, uh, and they turned out to be highly addictive, um, more psychologically addictive, and people were staying on them, not because they were working, but because they were avoiding withdrawal effects of coming off them. And now they're recommending they should only be used for two or three weeks in a row. But I still know of people who are on these things for months and months. Um, so anxiety and depression are often what we call comorbid. And anxiety is also a feature of eating disorders. Um, eating disorders are interesting because there's no drug therapy for eating disorders. 
but they may be given drugs to control levels of anxiety and depression, which can occur with eating disorders. Um, so yes, it, it's similar to depression in that sense, but it's, um, it's more difficult to pin down because of these pervasive feelings of threat. And of course, from your own perspective, there are very clear evolutionary explanations for anxiety conditions such as OCD uh, and generalized anxiety, which are, um, haven't led to treatments of any sort. Well, yes, yes, no, we won't start that lecture yet. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it another time. Uh, but yes, anxiety, um, unlike depression, which divided into two or three subcategories, anxiety disorders are divided into a number of subcategories, generalized anxiety, OCD, um, agoraphobia, um, and uh, a couple of others. So it's uh, divided into more categories. And for some of those like OCD, we find that drugs are far less effective. Whereas for generalized anxiety, that sense of waking up in the morning and think, holy cow, I've got a day to get through. You find drugs can be effective, but remember that drugs never 100% effective. So individual differences. Cool. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, I'm sure there's going to be additional questions rolling in. So to our viewers, you can ask um, Simon and eight questions. You just put your question into the chat bar and we'll pick them up for the panel after Uta's talk. I've got more questions for you, Simon, but I'm going to hold on to them for the minute. And of course, we want to ask you about how you came to do the kind of uh, research that you do, your specialization in, uh, in these areas. Um, and also, is there any creativity and imagination in, in the way you conduct um, your, your area of research. So uh, stay with us, I mean, don't go away, um, but I'm gonna ask you to unshare your, your slides, um, mute your video and your audio. And I'm delighted now to bring in our second speaker, um, Dr. Uta Lersch, who is a clinical psychologist, um, has recently started up her, her new project with Stan the Storm and is going to be speaking to you about resilience. Uh, so welcome, Uta. Thank you very much. Are you happy to get started? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to mute my audio and video and I'll see you back uh, at the end of Uta's talk. Thanks. Fabulous. Um, welcome, everyone. And uh, thank you to be with us on uh, probably this rainy and grey morning. At least this is where I'm sitting and seeing outside. Uh, my name is Dr. Uta Liersch. You will hear from my accent, of course, that I'm German. Um, I'm an accredited and chartered counseling psychologist who works in between these two areas of academia and clinic. And um, I'm a founder of a mental health app, which is called wisto.com, withstand the storm. But despite all of these things, what I foremost, of course, am, I'm a human being. I, like you, have had difficult times and somehow all of us, have managed to overcome them or muddled through them. How do I know that you were able to manage it even though I don't see you? Otherwise we wouldn't be around, right? We wouldn't be here sitting, listening, talking if we had not been able to get through it. Get through what we call in psychology, mental distress, depending from which modality you come, psychopathology, um, what I like to call with my clients, mental suffering. As a psychologist, of course, I have a vast interest into understanding where does this suffering come from? Um, where and how has it built up in the people I am working with? I'm also interested in how did it come about that we muddled through it? How well did we get through it? Are there residuals from old problems that are still kind of biting us or, or, or are difficult for us at this moment in time? How is it that some of us seem to bounce back like this, where others are, are falling deeply into, a client described it as the black hole of despair. And I think psychologists are really, really good and psychology as a science is really good in focusing on understanding of what has gone wrong. And Simon so beautifully described a lot of research where we are looking at why 
are we having these different types of suffering, which when you're using the DSM or the ICD, both are manuals which are used to classify mental suffering in categories. Um, why these types of suffering of mental distress are actually existing. In fact, we are so good in doing this in psychology that between, the, the, between 1972 and 2006, there was a ratio of five to one on research around depression compared to well-being. So what do I mean with that? Psychologists, the science of psychology is much more likely to put resources in to understanding what is called abnormal psychology rather than to understand normal psychology. Even though that this is now slowly changing, the problem with this is, is that it leaves the field very wide open for people to tell us, to advise us how to get through problems. And I'm pretty sure you know these voices, you know these advices when life is really difficult. You hear these life gurus telling you, just be positive, right? Just do this, just change, just think about something different or just stop thinking about that what creates anxiety. Just do something differently. And you know what? We could have a whole talk around what the word just actually triggers in our linguistic makeup. What I mean with that, we have a new kit on the block, which is third wave behaviorism, to which acceptance and commitment therapy is counted to, um, which is based on something that is called um, RFT, which looks at how the words we are using, our linguistic in our mind is actually creating, helping us to move towards a certain type of behavior, whether this is behavior that is nurturing or depleting. And the word just literally merits a whole lecture around how depleting it can be. And yet the word just do it is used very often to help people to go through their personal suffering. A very good one is just don't let it get to you. Don't be bothered by it. And this leads me very much to my understanding of resilience connected to the social discourse. So how people talk about it, how people perceive it, how are people are using it when they come either to my workshops or into my clinic. Because the social understanding of resilience is don't be bothered by it. Don't be bothered when you are losing a loved one. Don't be bothered when you are ill. Don't let it get to you when you have a really, really difficult job. Don't be bothered if you are be betrayed by people you are trust. Now here is a very interesting thing because that idea of don't be bothered is actually related to something which is called toughness. Now, toughness has this very cool vibe, right? Um, when you look at, at, at movies, it's always the tough guys who get through it and are the heroes. But what does toughness actually mean? Allow me to give you an example. You know demolition derbies, right? Where you have these cars that are racing around, bumping into each other. Now, interestingly, toughness is measured by the amount of bumps a car gets while it keeps on going until it breaks down. Now allow me to repeat this. This idea, not being bothered by that what is difficult, links to the idea of toughness. And the metaphor I am using here is thinking about a demolition derby where you see the cars getting bumped and bumped and bumped until it breaks down. 
Now, the question I have to you and the question I ask my clients, is this how you want to live your life? Do you want to collect all these bumps until you've taken so many that you cannot carry on? This, although it is said being resilience when you speak to people, is by no means any resilience at all. Because what is resilience? Resilience has a very different nature. And allow me to offer you another, another picture. Think about a metal sheet, right? And think about this metal sheet being clamped between two hands. And then you have this big weight which is thrown onto the sheet. The force is bending that sheet. So you have that very strong metal yielding to the pressure that is applied. Now in, um, in engineering, what we are doing is we are measuring the resilience of the sheet coming back to its form or partially to its form it had before the bump. And this is what we are actually saying resilience is. Resilience has got nothing to do with not being bothered. It has got something to do with bouncing back. Now, there is a, a definition where we often say, uh, we, we, we define resilience as protective factors, as processes, as a mechanism that contributes to a good outcome, a good life, despite experiencing stresses from the outside. Now, what does the, the, the metal sheet analogy actually teaches us? I think it teaches us three different very important things. And here I connect very deeply with what Simon said in the answer of the second question is around that false understanding, we gotta be happy all the time. Because we can only be resilient, we can only develop resilience, we can only become resilient if we are actually experiencing adversity. Only if we are experiencing and working with the challenges life brings us, we are giving ourselves the chance to become resilient human beings. That's the first teaching, that's the first learning we need to take out. The second one is, remember when I spoke about the metal, how it yields, how it literally gives away? What this picture tells us that it is a normal reaction, probably not even a response, a normal reaction to yield under pressure and stress. I think this is a very important teaching because it tells us that we are not in need of pretending to be this, of pretending not to be affected by these stresses. This is where compassion comes in towards ourselves. Again, a new kit, a new kit of therapy on the block, labeled a compassion-focused therapy, which comes under third wave behaviorism, which gathers a lot of momentum in clinical research at the moment. And compassion means in that sense, not saying everything is happy and glory, dory and beautiful, but compassion in a clinical sense, in the research sense is, to notice that life is difficult and then have the willingness to do something about it. So two teachings so far, we need to understand if we want to cooperate resilience into our lives. 
Firstly, it is only happening if we are allowing the idea that adversity and difficulties are part and parcel of our lives. And secondly, that yielding under pressure and stress is a human being reaction to stresses we are having in our life. There is one more really important thing. Um, and I, I, I actually invite you to walk with me here because I would like to connect the idea of resilience into and with your personal life. I started the talk by saying, you and I, both we had difficulties which we somehow overcame. I would like you for a moment to check in with what these difficulties were. And in your, in your own mind, think about a couple of situations. Could have been, you know, very bitchy friends. Could have been a failed exam. Could have been not getting the job you wanted to have. Could be something that you are always tired. What are these challenges you have faced in the past or are facing at the moment? And if you are listening to the talk later on, it might be a good idea to just pause for a moment and note them down. What I would like you to do now is to look at these different examples and think about, are they actually going together? Can I put a category on top of them. And I suppose what you are noticing is that there are different categories, different categories of these challenges. So some of them might be around relationships, right? Some might be around performance, some might be around health. And when we are looking at these categories, what you are noticing again, that they come in different environments. So a stressor within a relationship with your partner is a very different stressor in a relationship with your family. So this takes me, of course, to the third teaching. We need to understand as human beings to implement resilience in our life, that how resilience looks in your life and how resilience looks in my life can never look the same because we are using that process of resilience, that multifaceted idea of resilience in different environments, in different times of our lives. So in psychology, we would say resilience is a very idiosyncratic, a very individualized process, which we need to discover across time. So let me just quickly recap what I said so far. I said toughness is fundamentally different to resilience. Resilience, if we are you coming back to the metaphor of remember the sheet of metal, Resilience teaches us three things. In order to be resilient, we have to, dare I say, allow and invite the idea that adversity and problems and stresses are part and parcel of our lives. What I say in clinic very often, happiness, totally overrated. The second teaching is that it is normal for us to yield under stress. And resilience has got to do how, with how we are bouncing back from the stressor. So how we are relating to that what is difficult in our lives. And with a little exercise you and I have done together, of course, what you've noticed is that where we are using the resilience and at what time in our lives we are using it looks very different. Which means the skills we have to gather in order to say we are becoming more resilient 
they have to be quite individualized, idiosyncratic to our needs, how we are at this moment in time. There's beautiful research out by um, a lady called uh, Carol, Carol Dweek, and she's from Stanford University. And the research on resilience is, uh, is, is predominantly done with children. But I would like to offer you, at um, coming slowly to the end of the talk, this idea, looking at growth mindset versus a stable or stagnating or fixed mindset, as it was researched in children. The idea of a mindset that allows growing is a mindset that has been deeply linked in there in the Stanford research papers with the idea of becoming a resilient person. Now, what is a growth mindset? It is when children are given a task which are really difficult and those kids say, yeah, really difficult. And you know what, I'm gonna try it again. I seem to fail a lot. I try it again because eventually I will be able to manage it somehow. This is in differentiation to what she called the fixed mindset. The fixed mindset is for children who say, it is too difficult, get me out of there. I will not be able to do that. Now, how does this link to these three teaching points I offered you today? It links in the following way. Both children notice there is a problem, right? What I said, one part of resilience is allowing and noticing that there is adversity in our life. Because without it, we are never going to train it. Both children are struggling, having a struggle with that pressure. Both set of children were failing. The way they managed these fails was deeply different. One of them managed fail by saying, I'm not touching it again, right? And here we are saying, these group of children will not, probably not um, develop a resilient mind across time. The other group of children said, I'm gonna try it again. So here we have this deep interaction with the problem, with the fail, with the difficulty, which allowed them to bounce back to where they were before, with one, of course, incredible difference. They have gathered more skills on the way throughout. What the researchers found out at the end, that when you look at performance, those children with what they called the growth mindset outperformed the children with the stagnating or fixed mindset. So how to withstand the storm is where I want to link back. Before you go into any skill training, where whatever there is, right? Be it mindfulness, be it, be it um, a, a CBT-led approach, be it an existential or humanistic approach, which comes all with its tools, right? Where people say, look, you have to always say in the morning, I'm a great person and this is gonna change your life. I want you to hold your horses. I would like you to think about, firstly, where is the adversity in my life? And am I allowing myself to engage with it? Am I also giving myself, letting myself off the hook because I realize it is normal to react to adversity? And then start to find out what personal skills do you need to bolster? Do you need to develop in order to bounce back? so that you are learning across your whole life how to work with stresses, negative triggers and problems better.
Thank you so much, Uta. Again, uh, fantastic talk, and, and I've learned so much myself. Um, we're going to give a few minutes for uh, our viewers to pop in any questions that they want um, before before we move to a panel. But um, uh, I think it was such an important point that you made about resilience and and everything we've talked about today too, with with um, psychiatric conditions um, are so individual. Right? You cannot compare them person to person. And I think that there is always that desire to compare ourselves to our friends, to our siblings um, uh, and everyone else around us, um, which, which may alter our own perception of how we're coping um, in our daily lives. But surely also there's going to be um, an impact uh, on your ability to be resilient based on those individuals who are around you, be it um, your your family, your friends, or even, as I've got now here, your <laughs> pets, that's my Wolfie. Um, can you say something about um, what, it, what difference it makes um, with those individuals around you to your uh, ability to be resilient? Yeah. So there's a, there's a beautiful um, uh, paper out, uh, Bangor University has, has um, um, they've published a paper around what is resilience, because we still don't know. I mean, it's a multifaceted process um, and we are still trying to operationalize it in order to, 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 to research it well. Um, and what we indeed know is how we are brought up and especially the, the, the social economic status in which we are growing up has a huge impact on how resilient we are. And why, it's, it's not necessarily tr the translation money equals resilience. I just wanna be very clear about it. But of course, what is, what, what is, what does money give us, right? It, give us, it gives us the opportunity possibly that, um, our caregivers have more time for us, right? That um, when there is a problem that we can discuss how we work it, that the ability to, to, to be patient to a child that needs soothing, right? Um, because the teeth are coming is most probably higher in, in parents who don't have to work two or three jobs in order to provide food, right? So this is what I mean with social economic status, just to be very clear. So um, their, their paper looks at resilience in, in various areas. And one of them is the developmental area. And um, they're very clear in the sense of this social economic status is a huge contributor in giving the kids the first dose of how resilience looks like. Most probably what it means is we do not have to be afraid of adversity. Yeah. Um, we do not have to be afraid of failing because we will be good enough to handle it. If you are, however, brought up or if you are together with a group of people where failing is not an option, right, where... Um, um, failing is something that is bad. It reflects negatively on you. How will you ever learn to be resilient? And now social economic status comes in really as an interesting factor as well, because a lot of high flying families have a huge vested interest in their children performing exceptionally, right? Where an A is most probably not an option. And if you have a B, what have you done wrong? So here again, the first point of building up resilience is the ability to embrace these adversities. If you are brought up that adversity is nothing that can be in your life, you're never gonna have the trainings field you need to become resilient. And you, what you've answered there actually has, has touched on um, some of the elements of a question from one of our viewers, Alberto, who's um, said uh, children are said to have a greater ability to adapt to new situations and face 
um, changes or, or challenges. Um, is it related to our brain and the way it changes as we become older or is it mainly our life experiences? So it, 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 it sounds very distinct. Is it either the life experience or is it the brain? And uh, I think we got to stop believing uh, brain or mind, right? Uh, I'm sure, uh, allow me to say, I'm sure Descartes was a clever man, but he was basically wrong, right? We cannot say body and mind are two distinct entities which somehow possibly have an interchangeable line. We need to look at it together because what we know through the plasticity, of course, our um, our our brains, so our brains are changing across lifespan, possibly, probably even less quickly or less easily as older we get. But this might not might not necessarily only has got something to do with the structural, the biological component of the brain, because as older we get, as more biases we have as well, as more experts we become. And whilst we all want to be experts, to be an expert, it has a really big fallacy because this means we say we know something, which means we are very biased. So um, what I want to say with that is our life experience give us, gives us a repertoire of how to manage conflict, anxiety, any type of adversity, right? And depending on how good the repertoire is, you are getting better in managing different types of, of, of adversities across time. However, if you have a repertoire that is actually depleting in nature, yeah, the interesting thing is you will stick to this repertoire because humans are creatures, creatures of habit, right? So you might carry on using a strategy which is actually depleting across time. Okay. But are you able to change that? Of course. Uh, nothing in our brains stops us from learning when we are getting older. Are we more resistant towards it? Yes. Yeah. Is this because of structure or because of our mind memory? I, 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 I really can't say. Yeah. They're all very good points. Uh, thank you again, Uta, really fascinating talk. At this point, I'd like to ask Simon to join back in now. Um, and as our viewers are, are asking or thinking of more questions to ask, there are a couple of items that I mentioned early on in the introduction to Saturday Science, um, sorry, set, Science Saturdays, I keep saying that backwards, uh, that, that we want to address with our speakers. Now you two are um, slightly different from our previous speakers in that you have uh, additional activities that you've been involved with, um, not just lecturing to undergraduate students, but Simon, you um, work on or have worked on A-level curriculum and education system, and you've also written books to this purpose. And Uti, you um, not only lecture, but you are also um, a, a practitioner, you, you are a counseling psychologist, so quite, quite um, different sets of activities that you are doing on daily basis. And I just thought it'd be really interesting if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to be doing the kind of work that you do. Uh, is that okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, great, who wants to go first? Well, Simon, go for it. <laughs> so this is a brief life history is it that um, yeah um, at uh, secondary school I wasn't um, awfully successful I did sciences and I was okay but not outstanding um, in my final year um, I was awarded a prize basically for being the oldest boy left in the school because I retook A levels and that prize was a book called Physiological Psychology by Morgan it's a classic you know it's um, it must be worth 20 pounds by now um, I cannot remember why I asked for it, um, but I went to Cardiff University after school and did joint philosophy and psychology, along with my Morgan's physiological psychology textbook. And in the first year, uh, I wrote a long philosophy essay that came back with the words, uh, this is an excellent psychology essay, but doesn't have much to do with philosophy. And that 
so after that last two years, I specialized in psychology. And to be perfectly honest, it was a fascinating subject anyway, but I could also do it fairly easily. It sort of fitted in with a worldview about um, explaining people's behavior, uh, which is an aspect of it I really liked. So um, I did reasonably well at Cardiff. Um, then um, wanted to come back to London and there was a post going at Birkbeck, in fact, for a PhD position in an area called psychopharmacology, which is the effects of drugs on behavior. Birkbeck in those days had uh, a, a fairly long tradition of research. Um, it was animal-based research using rats, essentially, into the effects of drugs on behavior. And so I applied for and got that postgraduate position. Um, and that was in the uh, early 70s. And it coincided with a period when uh, in Sweden in particular, they were for the first time identifying pathways in the brain linked to transmitters. So dopamine pathways, et cetera, were being identified. Important to note that for the previous 30, 40 years, drugs were given for psychological disorders with no understanding of how they worked in the brain. It was only in the 70s and 80s that finally we unraveled how they were operating. Anyway, my PhD was on the cholinergic system using a transmitter called acetyl choline later implicated in Alzheimer's disease and others. And we were looking at um, models of anxiety in rats and the involvement of cholinergic pathways. And also uh, serotonin, you know, which is still going today, of course, in relation to depression. So I did that for a number of years and enjoyed it. Um, there weren't the complications of working with human subjects who tend to be difficult, individual differences, quite complicated. So working with rats was straightforward. Um, and then in the early 90s, um, rebuilding works meant the animal lab closed. Um, and it coincided with a time when I went to examine a PhD student from another college and they had done pretty well what I had done for my PhD. And what had changed were, was the pharmacology and knowledge of the brain, synapses, the range of drugs they could use, blah, blah, blah. Behaviorally, nothing had changed. They were still using mazes and this, that and the other. And I was a bit dispirited by that. I just thought all this research, all these animals, all these years, and frankly, behaviorally, not much has changed. We still don't really understand why rats run around mazes. Coincided with the lab being knocked down and not being rebuilt. I was then appointed as head of department because no one else wanted the job and did that for 10 years. And by that time I was in you know, late career and um, my role then changed, not deliberately, but I tried various lines of research, none of which I got really involved with, partly because of developments in scanning and EEG techniques and all sorts of things. If you didn't do those from your PhD onwards, it was very hard to get into them, to pick up just on the technological side. And my role since then, I feel, has been um, to hover around saying, you do all this scanning work, what's it actually demonstrated? You know, you, you, you say you found the source of empathy in the brain. How have you measured empathy? Oh, we gave them a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. you know, is this a satisfactory way of measuring empathy? Um, how did you do it in the scanner? Well, we had the participant in the scanner, they held hands with their partner and we gave the partner an electric shock just to, <laughs> and then measured changes in the brain. And you know, this stuff was rubbish and yet it was being published. You know, it got into the papers, you know, brain center of empathy. And so my role was to lecture students and just say, these techniques are wonderful, but the, you know, the neuroscience side is in some ways easy. It's the behavioral psychology side that's difficult. You know, trying to measure and assess behavior. So I just feel um, uh, if I can just put across to students, um, don't be misled. Um, I have a feed on my phone, a neuroscience feed. Every day, literally, there are new findings on brain and behavior every day. And what you want to do is give students um, the ability to assess that work and to say it really doesn't. It's not really as significant. Yeah. So now, just as a final point, um, I 
formally retired in 2017. Uh, I'm still lecturing at Birkbeck and it's thoroughly enjoyable, but that increases uh, my, my, I'm able to say, you know, I've been through all this. When I did my psychology degree, I had two textbooks that covered the whole degree. <laughs> now, if you do a psychology degree, every module will have its own textbook. So you're looking at 10, 15 textbooks. There wasn't much psychology around. So I've been privileged to see developments of these areas also in on the therapy side, development of all these new therapies and approaches. It's just, so I feel my role is perspective, um, is for students going into the field, be realistic, but there's, yeah, it's, there are so many fascinating areas. But you, you raise such an important point, which is as important to our students as it is to any viewer out there, that just because it's published or it's in the media, doesn't mean that it's good science yeah. and that you must have a critical eye and you must question these things and you must think about correlation versus causation and you, you, you and there's there's all of these different ways to view the science and good rigorous science is hard to come by um and and i love that we've got people like you simon who's keeping <laughs> us in check as we go no, forward doesn't mean anything I <laughs> <laughs> no brilliant point just one last example. In the genetics club, periodically they review the latest paper on genes in schizophrenia, where uh, following Dr. Meeburn last week explaining about, you know, you can analyze a whole genome now. So you'll see a paper that has a thousand people diagnosed with schizophrenia and a thousand controls. And these were the differences, therefore these are linked to schizophrenia. Well, no. What were the diagnoses of schizophrenia? How many had positive symptoms? How many had negative symptoms? How this, that, and the other? Yeah. And you know, it just, yeah, anyway, I won't carry on. I think we need to do another whole set of talks about the limitations of science. Yeah. Um, and that would be super interesting to bring in because we do get swept up in, in the incredible technology that we have now to the point where the technology tends to lead the science versus, yeah. versus the experimental design leading the science. Yeah. Uh, Especially if we are if we are going back to the idea why are we researching schizophrenia yeah. spectrum disorder? Because I, I, I say it a bit polemically, I thought we wanted to help people. And uh, even if you have even even if you have clients who have the same diagnosis, and I'm going to put it in vertical commas, the only thing I know for sure is you have different different presentation of yes. these diagnostic things. Yeah. So if you are taking uh, these very loud papers into the real world, <laughs> yeah. they, they are not often worth the paper they are written on. No. And um, coming back to, to, to the SSRIs that the Lancet report uh, review in, in was it 2018, um, which had this, this, this huge outcry on, on the newspapers, which said um, antidepressants work. And that was the Times. It wasn't the Sun. It was the Times, right? Mm. Or the Independent said um, GPs have to, have to prescribe drugs more because they help. Mm. And I mean, it's the Lancet. The Lancet is, a, is, is of course, reputable. Mm. But if you look at the translation of what the Lancet report said about SSRIs to what then was translated into the public, it is poor. At, at, that's the that's very friendly way of saying it. Because if I look at effectiveness of eight weeks and say this has got anything to do with healing depression, then, I mean, that's, that's, that's nonsense. That's utter nonsense. Eight weeks. Mm. That's right. Um, so, so there's a whole host of, of questions that these, that these raise and, and what are the motivations and the rationale for the study? So yes, that's a whole nother talk series. We'll have to leave that one there. Uh, <laughs> Uta, can you tell us about how you found your way into your role? Yeah. Um, Allow me to, 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 to say, um, and of course, uh, I know I know Chile, so Chile has to listen to it again, and I do apologize. But I would like to really quickly say how I came to sit here where I sit, because I, I would say uh, I have quite an unusual pathway to academia, because I have no A-levels. 
Um, I was deemed unfit for higher education. Um, I'm highly dyspraxic. I have dyscalculia and dys uh, and um, can't can't spell for tuppence. Let's just put it like this. Um, which uh, in Bavaria was very clearly at the age of 10 a sign of not being clever. Mm. Yeah. And um, I had, uh, I, I did uh, uh, an apprenticeship as a hotel manager at the age of 17. I traveled the world with this job. It was really interesting. Um, I mean, I worked in South Africa, in, I worked in the UK, I worked in the States. Um, what it didn't give me, it didn't give this brain, which was a apparently not very clever, not enough to think and to, 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 to learn. I changed jobs after 10 years in, in, in the hospitality industry. I had um, um, a learning center then at home together with a company which is called Hallander on Early English. And they gave me the opportunity to go into teaching because they, they were, were, were interested in people who had life experience, were able to speak English well, as good as I can, right? And uh, said, yeah, of course I can imagine how to teach children English as if it would be a second mother tongue without using translation. Now what happened, I worked with them for 10 years. What happened of course, is I became interested in how do we actually learn language, right? Why did I have to suffer through schools? Why did my English teacher say, say to me, Ute, there are two people of are two groups of people, one that are able to speak English, one that aren't, and you don't belong to the first group. So, and, and guess what? A couple of years later, my English is good enough. What happens? And this was my entrance, my, my, my knocking onto psychology, right? Um, because of who I was, because of the school, school things I had, I was not able to go uh, to study in Germany, but engineering. And trust me, you, you want me to be a psychologist. You don't want me to be an engineer because this would just be, this would go really, really wrong. Um, and I, 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 I left um, the, the, the educational part for which I worked for 12 years. And I worked with children which came to me with these diagnoses of Autism. I don't know what autism is. I have a child that I need to work differently. ADHD. I don't know what ADHD is, but I have to work differently. So I started to read about what these children came with whilst I worked with them, right? Um, and I, I came to the UK and it's because of my husband. So and anyone who doesn't like me, he's to blame that I'm in the country. <laughs> but what the UK gave me, the UK gave me the opportunity to do a master's. So I never started with a bachelor. I started with a master's at, U, at, at Oxford Brookes University in creative writing. They also figured out that whilst you are quite clever, apparently, you are dyslexic. Right. So this for me was a huge relief because for me, being able to spell correctly and seeing your spelling mistakes was like this with being somebody who is allowed to think critically. Yeah. And, and Oxford Brookes University was the first one who started to create space between these topics and saying, look, just because you can't write as, as, as our spelling system asks you to do, and you can't see the different letters, doesn't mean you are an idiot, because that's what I thought until then. Um, I finished my master's and then I called Birkbeck University in September and I said, I'm, I'm, I really would like to study um, psychology. Would you guys take me? And uh, the person on the phone said, yeah, of course you have a master's. We looked at your, your, your previous experience. Uh, by then I was a mature student, right? Mature for me always links to old cheese. So <laughs> I was a mature student and this is how I came to, 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 to study at Birkbeck. Um, I worked very quickly at the uh, Center for Brain and Cognitive Development. I was able to become a, well, a an honorary research assistant. I worked on the BASIS project. So I worked then with, with children with autism. Um, for the three years I did my bachelor. 
for which I was very grateful for because all of a sudden, all these theories which we were taught during the lectures became real life whilst I worked for the basis study. And you had all this practical experience working with children with diagnoses before you learned about the theory underlying um, the diagnoses. So that's really interesting. So I did the bachelor. Then I, I, uh, I, I started a master's in, in clinical psychology because I wanted to go uh, become a clinical psychologist. I had a cancer diagnosis. I stopped the master's because of the treatment. And during th that change in my life, I realized, look, Uta, you've done a lot of theory. Um, I think it's time to go into the real world. I decided uh, a month after my treatment was finished to leave the UK. I lived then in Sri Lanka for uh, three or four months and I worked uh, for the National Institute for Mental Health, for halfway homes, for the House Victoria, where, children, where, where, where there were, uh, for, the, for the female part, where there are women with mental but mainly um, physical disabilities. Um, I came back, Hertfordshire University was so kind to keep the place waiting um, open for me. They said, would you want to come back? But at this time I said, no, I think I don't want to do another master's. I would like more experience. So I then went to Lambeth College and did um, a college certificate in counseling. And whilst I did the college certificate, I applied for a doctorate in counseling psychology. Why not clinical? Um, because I'm Bavarian, so we are very direct. I'm old, right? I would have never gotten onto the clinical doctorate um, with the age I am having. The counseling psychology doctorate allowed me to do that because they honor life experience on a very different level. Yeah. So I did a three year doctorate, HCBC accredited, of course, uh, I'm chartered with the British Psychological Society. And um, in my last year of the doctorate, I was given an incredible opportunity at the university that taught me psychology at Birkbeck. Um, I was, I gotten the opportunity to work together with, uh, with, with Michael, who is the model leader in individual differences as a co-lecturer. And um, later on, um, I was interviewed Chile by yourself, um, whether I would like to write the clinical and counseling psychology model also for university um, of London for Birkbeck. And I have been doing so successful. We we're so happy to have you running that module. Our students absolutely adore it. So it's it's been a massive, uh, valuable contribution to our to our bachelor's degree. So so that's me. And and I think um, whilst I most probably will never understand multiple regressions, <laughs> and I I think I have resigned to that. Um, my thinking is very phenomenological in nature. Um, it is quite existential. And what I notice, what I bring to the team is a very precise, critical understanding of stuff. So numbers don't impress me, yeah? Um, which I think is a good thing, especially that psychology hungers so much for being a, an, an empirical science. Um, but I think what you both expressed here is the, the massive breadth of psychology. Psychology is not just one thing. It's incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, you know, it, it, it has some very quantitative approaches. It has some qualitative approaches. These things can come together at many levels as well. Um, but but it, is, it is beautifully multidisciplinary. And the more multidisciplinary it becomes, I think the stronger it becomes. Yeah. Um, which is great. I know we're running short on time. We have lots of thank yous in, in our text um, for, for your two talks. But there was one question that I did want to pose to you both very quickly, <clears throat> um, which is about, um, we, we are psychological sciences at Birkbeck. We, we are classed as a science. Um, and and that, that is, is quite a badge of honor, I think, for many of us uh, in that in that we think, I think there's this perspective that um, when you're classed as a science, you're, you're more robust uh, a, a subject area. I'm not sure that's, that's true at all, but it also comes with the connotations of a science being um, uh, attracting a certain kind of individual. 
who is very numbers focused and detail focused and wearing white coats and working in laboratories. And it's all very precise stuff going on and not a lot of creative thought, and not a lot of imagination. And I'd love to dispel some of that because I know for myself, my area, um, doing evolutionary and developmental psychology actually involves a huge amount of creative thought. And that's probably the most exciting part of science for me is thinking up new ways to ask questions and develop experiments. And, and I just wanna ask you both, have you found um, a way to be creative or introduce creativity into your work? Um, I was thinking about this and realizing that I have not been awfully creative uh, in my, <laughs> research and if um, if any of our listeners do go through college do go to university do start a phd the safest way is always to build on an established way of doing the work of following previous studies and using their methods etc and then developing on those um, in the rat world i did my research in there were surprisingly a number of ways of being creative because we wanted models of anxiety um, and we built on other labs work but we devised our own it's called an elevated maze because what worries rats well cats and things but it was too complicated to have cats in the lab um, but if you have a rat running across um, a bridge that's two feet off the ground that makes them anxious and you have a safe place at either end so they run across from one end to the other um, and then we wanted to devise a way of making that um, of making it anxious and then more anxious. And so we actually developed a way of having a vibrating bridge, like the old London bridge that wobbled a few years ago. And that turned out to be a very good way of testing anti-anxiety drivers because the weaker ones worked, they're more likely to cross the bridge if they take this drug, but they wouldn't cross the wobbly one. A stronger anti-anxiety drug, they would cross both of them quite cool. That's so cool. <laughs> but um, I think, uh, um, the baby lab, Azuta, will, will know. I'm constantly impressed with the methods they devise for testing babies who aren't manageable. You can't control them, but you want ways of assessing their uh, perception, their memory, their this, that, and the other. And one area of research, not done in our baby lab, but um, Simon Baron Cohen, the brother of the more famous Sasha, um, one of our oh, leading... I said that. <laughs> One of our leading researchers in, um, in autism um, wanted to look at the role of testosterone because autism occurs more often in boys than girls, where there are controversies about the diagnosis in girls, but we won't go into that. But there seems to be a male dominance for autism. And he felt this was due to the effects of testosterone, which is released while the baby is developing before birth. And he wanted to look at testosterone levels and behavior in the baby and um, what he thought of was um, how do you assess testosterone you need to take uterine fluid the fluid that's bathing the baby while it's developing um, and how do you get this sample you can't do it ethically um, but there are a group of women who are at risk for down syndrome uh, for the ba their baby having downs older women usually um, and there's a test they do to extract uterine fluid, uh, just to check the chromosomal makeup to make sure the baby, uh, or to make sure, just to see if the baby is a Downs, potentially a Downs baby, and then um, helping the mother adjust to that situation. But um, usually there isn't a risk of Downs. They have uterine samples. And what they did was follow up those babies after they were born, tested them immediately after birth. And I, that's just an example. There are lots of other examples of people who've sat back and thought, here is a problem, how do we solve it? What are the potential um, sources we can use for data? What are the methods we might be able to use uh, that are both ethical, interesting, and will answer the, the question? So um, I think there's creativity all along the line. You might find in a PhD, you're building on previous work very closely. And frankly, you don't want to be too imaginative in a PhD in case it goes wrong. Um, you want to show you can do research, and that you're very competent and you can understand all the ideas but after your PhD when you get into research positions or a lectureship and you can develop your own research field um, yeah you need to sit back and the most successful researchers are highly creative in 
not just in the methods they use, uh, but also in the questions they try to answer. As I was saying earlier, I have a strong feeling that uh, analysis of behavior has always lagged behind the technology for understanding the brain. Um, so creative ways of saying people are complicated. Are there aspects of human behavior we can look at uh, that tell us something about people to get away from this problem of complexity? It's very, very difficult. Um, and that's why many psychologists prefer working with memory or attention, something very specific. As Uta finds with her clients, they're complicated. You know, they have issues, they have this and that. How do you study any of those as a psychologist? So lots of room for creativity, lots of problems to be answered. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Uta, do you want to comment? I, I think so. When you do uh, when you do the root I've taken, right, be it a counselling or clinical psychology, um, what we are called we are called evidence based practitioners. So of course we, we we want to know the evidence in order to practice, right? Um, and if you are taking this seriously, then you must be creative because what you must always do is on the one side you read the paper, but on the other side you need to observe how does this paper, how does this theory. How does this, this, this manual of a type of treatment, which is based on research, how does this actually translate into the real world? Simon, you said it's the sitting back. And I think the sitting back is where creativity starts because the sitting back allows us to observe. It allows us to see what is actually going on. Um, and um, for, for my research, so I researched uh, acceptance in um, a cohort of chronic pain clients who disengaged with acceptance-based therapy, right? Um, on the one side, of course, it's my German brain. We like to look at the stuff that doesn't work, I was told. But on the other side, what I it, it was the sitting back. It was the sitting back and saying, wow, every paper around acceptance and commitment therapy and reading based in chronic pain has a minimum dropout rate of 30%. That's a high dropout rate, right? Um, what happens in my own clinic? Even higher. Um, so the research paper to the real clinic already is a discrepancy. What is going on? And then I, 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 I used that idea of acceptance, which is already very well defined, right? So here we are going, I, I took something which has a very clear oper operationalization in the world of chronic pain. But what I did is I was, I, was, I was looking at it from a more philosophical angle and from a language angle, because I thought we are calling it acceptance, but hang on, that's a noun. A noun is static. But what I'm doing is progress and process. That's what you do in therapy, right? You don't do static stuff. You do progress and process. You are in the, in the business of change. So this has got nothing to do with nouns, has it? It has got everything to do with verbs. So my question then came very quickly, does a noun equal a verb? Um, which is a weird question to ask, I suppose, but that actually showed a huge differentiation of the clients when you looked at that, what is acceptance of chronic pain compared to accepting chronic pain and having subcategories of accepting, one of some of them are depleting, some of them seem to be nurturing for these people. And I think this is creativity. Creativity. What I say to my students: Look, you don't have to. You don't have to find something new. I don't even know whether new actually exists. What you need to see is that you need to see it new. Uh, I think you're absolutely right there. And, th and that is why I think having these different perspectives coming from different backgrounds, as you both have done different entry points into your studies that have led you on these paths to where you are now, incorporated a huge amount of life experience and multidisciplinary information. So you're able to draw from these different strings and in, in, in that way, see your subject area from a unique perspective. And I, I think that is where creativity thrives. Um, so it's lovely to see. Um, we, we've spent almost two hours now, so I think we're going to need to 
to um, wrap up today's program. I want to thank uh, both Uta and Simon so much for your talks today. They were fabulous. I'm so sorry to um, our listeners whose questions I didn't get to, um, some lovely questions, and um, hopefully we'll be able to address them in future talks as well. Um, if you missed part of this, uh, this program today, you can find the whole video stream on Birkbeck's YouTube channel. Just search for Science Saturdays. Next week is our final set of talks. I'm gonna be speaking to you about our divided brain and why we've evolved to have two sides that do slightly different things. Um, and Natasha Kirkham, Dr. Natasha Kirkham is gonna be talking to us about how baby meets the world and grows up in the middle of everything. Um, and because I'm gonna be giving one of the talks, I'm gonna be inviting back to the show, Dr. Emma Meeburn to do the hosting. Mm -hmm. um, so do join us next week for our final Science Saturday. Um, this has been a Birkbeck, uh, Me Human and National Saturday Club venture. Uh, thank you again and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Love the ears, incidentally. Thank <laughs> you.